Hello, I'm Dr. Russell Libby, and I welcome you to the world of medicine. There are a lot of spotlight issues in healthcare nowadays. If you look at any newspaper, they're talking about healthcare reform. We're spending a lot of legislative time, a lot of emotion, and a lot of our tax dollars on trying to figure out what to do with healthcare. You read about H1N1, swine flu as they call it, a very devastating and potentially significant medical problem for our country. And by the way, I want to make sure you know that you should get immunized. They're safe. The vaccines are important for people to use at this particular time. I've seen a lot of young people get very, very sick with this H1N1 flu. And then we have other issues that pop up every now and then, but one that seems to stay in the spotlight at all times is autism. It's a complicated and rather interesting condition. We know that, uh, as we just discovered in the past week, uh, we had some uh, evidence that came out from some studies around the world that looked at the incidents now in our country uh, that sort of says that we may have as many as 1 in 95 of our children uh, between the ages of 3 and 17 carry a diagnosis of some form of autism through their childhood. So it's an important topic. There are many nuances. There are lots of different kinds of autism, as we will come to learn in the show today. We have a specialist, Dr. Chuck Conlon. He's a developmental pediatrician. He practices in Bethesda, Maryland. And we're going to learn a lot from some families who have been touched by autism, families and even some patients who have come along to help share their story with us. So. You have a son who's been touched I with do. autism. Brian. Brian. Hi, Brian. Say hi. Hi. He doesn't All speak. Right. He's deaf Brian's also. communicating just as well. Yeah. So he's deaf as well. He's so tell us a little bit about what, uh, do you have a specific type of autism? That um, we don't know. Categorize? Actually, it, it was a while before um, he was actually diagnosed with autism. Having been uh, deaf since birth, he didn't communicate well to begin with, and so I believe maybe the autism either came, I believe it came after three, a little after three, but also it was very difficult because his communication was so delayed anyway that they attributed most of it to the deafness. And um, so it wasn't until much later that he was, he was said to be autistic. So you knew shortly after birth that he was deaf? Right, I knew at two months, um, but the pediatrician we happened to be going to, which was not your group, um, uh, another group uh, did not uh, would not test him, and so it wasn't until a year old that we discovered he was deaf. Okay, so and that's that's a fairly long stretch. Right. But you had a you had an inclination to believe that he might be deaf. Right. And at two months, that's a at pretty hard right, thing to tell. Right. Right. And what was it? Um, he, it was just. Um, just the way he slept very well, and he didn't stir when there were noises when he was sleeping, and um, I don't maybe a mother's intuition. I don't know. <laughs> was there any family history for nope. deafness? No family history. No family no. history. Uh, that's great. Uh, you know, of course, now they they do screen babies right. for hearing uh, shortly after birth. Right, and unfortunately, he was born at Bethesda Naval Hospital, and uh, they were not testing that at when he was born 18 years ago, and they had just started at Fairfax Hospital, but he was born at. Naval Hospital, and it was not, he was not tested. Yeah, and I think uh, we're picking him up a lot better right. now, but uh, it certainly gave you an interesting perspective. So he was three when he was diagnosed as he having was, something he, more than deafness then. Well, right. He, he received a cochlear implant at three, and it looked like the perfect candidate for a cochlear implant, and then two months after he was implanted, he stopped all speech that he had. He had maybe about 30 words and a lot of different sounds, and then two months after he was implanted, he stopped talking and and we don't know why we're gonna have to talk more about that that's that's a really interesting yeah. thing so it was a sensory overload of some well that's what I wonder if, if he had auditory we believe now he has auditory processing problems and I don't know if that's related to autism okay and you have children I do who have been touched as well I do. I have twins who are turning nine at the end of the month, right. Drew and David, and they are both on the autism spectrum. Uh, David is about mid-functioning, um, mid and Drew is a little bit higher functioning. So mid-functioning in terms of, so they're a pure autism diagnosis. We're going to learn are. a little bit about what these nuances are. Um, at what age 
were they diagnosed? They were diagnosed right before their third birthday. So when they weren't speaking at two and a half, that's when we were recommended to go ahead and get them tested and evaluated. And so we went to early intervention, had them come in, and did the full developmental assessment. Okay. And so honestly, we expected that they would uh, not do well on the speech developmental assessment, but we honestly had no idea that um, they would pretty much fail in every category. So um, it was right, we actually feel that we were fortunate that we had a group come in, they, they could, I'm sure they could tell as soon as they walked in because they had seen it all the time, um, but went through the testing and then walked us through it. And honestly, I actually wasn't surprised because you had seen, we had seen some of the classic signs of autism and um, you know, yep, those are my kids. Okay. And what were some of those classic signs? What were the things that were really, obviously you said there was delayed speech. Mm -hmm. So we know that that's probably one of the classic signs, but what other kinds of things were particularly obvious to you? Um, a lot of root, uh, issues with routine. And so um, in many ways it was a little bit easier to parent when they were um, very young because you could give them a deck of cards and they were happy for the afternoon. I mean, you sort them into red, you sort them into black, you make a nice line, um, and they were just good for a long period of time. Um, but at the same time, they also wanted things their way. And if they didn't get it their way, um, the aggression was very strong. Um, and transitions, of course, which we, in hindsight, could see beautifully, um, the transitions were horrible. And so if we did not appropriately prepare them for leaving a preferred activity, um, then aggression just came full force. Wow. Well, we're going to learn a little bit more about them in a few. And you have a child who's also had some issues. Yes, I have a seven-year-old son, Bryce, who is on the aut autism spectrum as well. Um, he's very high-functioning, but like this lady earlier, um, he had a speech delay. And I was very surprised, actually, to learn that he had autism because he made great eye contact with me. And I mistakenly thought that all children with autism didn't look at anybody in the eye. But he wasn't looking at anyone else but me in the eye. And I'm his mom, so I thought, well, I, you know, he's looking at me, so everything's fine, it's just the speech delay. But um, when he wasn't speaking also by almost three, um, I started thinking, well, what is causing the speech delay? Um, and we had a workup and found that he also f uh, was very behind on his motor skills, uh, physical skills, sensory processing, and that, that was also such a huge shock to me. Okay, so three is about when you got a good sense. Mm -hmm. Okay, which seems to be a pretty common time for people to really sort of settle into that diagnosis. Dr. Collin, we're talking about a great uh, group of, of diagnoses. Everyone is calling these autism, and there really are the nuances of, of the different types, but overall, I, I guess there are a set of symptoms and a set of conditions that we use to preconceive what autism is, and then it breaks into the different groups. What, how, do, how do we look at it from that point of view? Well, I think uh, all the families mentioned the concern about speech and language delays, and I think that's sort of the hallmark that people think about. And then with language, you obviously have to hopefully use it to communicate and to relate to others, and I think that's the piece of language that we're looking for, that there really is a communication problem, but there is a deficit in the use of language socially. And then we go back to the concern about uh, the cards that can be entertaining for a while, and it may be helpful for a little time and then our worry comes that you know we're just very repetitive or where we are restricted in the play there's a ritualistic sort of character to play and we're not sort of using pretend play and going off on themes and imagining how things go so i think we think of the hallmark as social communication but in association with restricted repetitive ritualistic types of behaviors and are there other kinds of uh, I guess, well, there are the behaviors as the communication skills, the interpersonal kinds of subjective skills. And um, sensory, do we ever see some sensory element there where kids seem to be overreactive to certain stimuli, yeah, things of that nature? That's another way that I think a lot of children present to us uh, clinically or our parents become concerned and seek uh, support through early intervention uh, is the concern that, you know, can't tolerate things unless it's just the right way. Um, that uh, sounds really bother me. I, I frantic when the vacuum cleaner comes on or a fire engine comes down the road. 
I can't stand the touch of certain materials. I was very happy when they ended up having jockey underwear without tags because I'm one of those old people with sensory problems. I can't wear wool pants. Uh, I'm the only person in our building and when we have a fire drill that puts my fingers in my ears and walks down the stairs, I don't know how anyone else can tolerate that. So these sensory things, I think, can result in lots of tantrums and behavior problems and that's another way that children might present even before parents recognize there might be language delays. And when people talk about the classification of these disorders, and of course people talk about the autistic spectrum, um, how do we as a profession tend to categorize them and then subdivide based upon their symptoms? Right. So I think today <clears throat> we're using this diagnostic manual that is helpful to some degree. Uh, we have sort of an overarching category called pervasive developmental disorders, under which are five conditions currently. And three of them probably are considered autism spectrum disorders. So we think about more classic autism in the sense of really having very limited communication early on. It may pick up as time goes on with intervention and maturation, but very limited communication. Uh, we think about Asperger's syndrome as individuals who might be more inclined to use language, but not as functionally. So they might have a great vocabulary, but not request what they want or not really be able to use it to develop relationships. And then, not sort of in a glib way, but we talk about pervasive developmental disorders not otherwise specified, meaning that, well, you don't really fit the category of autism and you don't really fit the category of Asperger's syndrome, and, but you have enough social communication and repetitive behaviors to say we think you're somewhere along the spectrum. Most of us feel early on because kids will merge from one potential diagnosis into another, and as they get older, um, may not look very different. And so people talk early on, perhaps, about using autism spectrum disorder as a global diagnosis and then kind of looking at how evolution takes place and maybe making a more definitive diagnosis depending on how they present. Uh, many of us now feel, and I think the next manual coming out, we'll talk about autism spectrum disorders and we'll talk about are we on the high end, are we kind of in the middle, or are we at the lower end? And that we may be looking more of a, as it, looking at it more as a spectrum as opposed to really trying to splinter out whether you have truly autism or Asperger's or PDD NOS. Right. Uh, and when we're talking about what happens to the kids through that, that spectrum of, of evolution, of maturation, some of them will start with a more severe form and ultimately have a much more mild form, I would take it. That's what you were insinuating. Uh, the other question I have is when we look at what's going on relative to the statistics. Now, just five years ago, it was one in 300 kids. Then it went down to one in 200, then one in 150, and now we're hearing one in, in 95. Uh, where do you think that comes from? Is that coming from a change in the frequency, in terms of the real frequency in the population, or are we finding some other way to, uh, to count more kids? Well, I think the, the recent statistic is, uh, you know, again, every time it comes out, it gets sort of more alarming and, and sort of more surprising in one sense. I do spend my day seeing lots of children with autism spectrum disorders in their families, so I, I sort of believe the numbers. That one study, you know, was based on parental reports. So there were 78,000 people who were interviewed by phone, and what better report than a parent to tell us, you know, what the diagnosis has been and what they see. A lot of people would argue, well, it would be nice to have confirmation, you know, is it truly this? I don't think there are too many parents who would like to have that diagnosis if it really weren't the diagnosis. So I think it, it, it probably makes sense that maybe we are talking about one in 91 or one in 95. I think what we found over the last several years is that we're much more inclusive in how we make the diagnosis. We're thinking about a lot more. And a number of children that might have been called global developmental delay are now being recognized as having autism spectrum disorders as a primary condition where they might have cognitive impairments as a secondary piece. At the same time, I think there's a lot we don't know about the environment and how that plays a role in genetics. And so a lot of research now being done on what's called epigenetics. How do you turn genes on and off? You might have a normal set of genes, but if they're not turned on at the right time or if they're turned off at the wrong time, uh, then you may end up with a different neurodevelopmental course. So I think this whole epigenetic phenomenon is going to be very important over the next several years in trying to understand, is this a role in the incidents that we're seeing now? So there likely are two issues to consider. One, of course, is, is a broader definition and a more inclusive definition that a lot of the sort of splinter developmental abnormalities really were some spectrum of autism. 
and that we're also including kids who may be very, very high functioning who prior to that time weren't really considered uh, necessarily as autistic per se in the spectrum, but that they just seem to have quirks and personalities, little uh, social maladaptation, things of that nature. Correct. Um, and then again, there, there is that consideration of the potential for having some environmental, uh, I guess, precipitate, something that may be bringing more of it out. Did, did you have any expectation? I mean, you could not have ever even imagined that you would have a child with autism. No, I certainly didn't think that at all. Um, I didn't have anything like that in the family. If some of it's genetic, sometimes you'd see maybe an uncle or someone. Um, so it really was quite a shock. Um, but I am one of those that has thought about vaccines, specifically the flu shot that I got when I was pregnant, and then the two flu shots that my my son Bryce got when he was nine months old that still had the thimerosal in it. And I know that's kind of a, a rocky yeah. subject, well, but it's, um, it's a straw grabber sometimes. To People me, say, to me, right. I think that's one of those things that could turn on a gene that might be sitting there um, that's susceptible so, for and, autism. And I'll have to just accept the statement because you're certainly there's no science to say that what you just said has anything to do with reality. So it's an emotional statement that people attach. And, and I only say that because I, I believe in vaccines as a pediatrician and their importance in terms of protecting the population from disease is really important. And that the timing and things of that nature certainly would make you want to feel that way. But from what I can deduce, and these have to do something, with, have something to do with genetic studies. I mean, you have, you have twins. I do. Who have to be wired similarly. I think so, and I've never gotten them tested to know for sure, but they certainly appear to be identical. So okay. we're going with the assumption that they're identical <laughs> twins. Okay. Um, but as you talked about, you know, did you have any expectation you might have a child with autism? Well, we had no expectation we might ever have twins. And uh, so, um, you know, it's kind of been a series of just you get what you get, and then you, you figure out how to move on with it and um, appreciate what you have. Right. Um, so there was nothing in the family history? No. Anything in your medical history that would have suggested to you? No. Are we seeing anything from a neuroanatomical point of view that, that represents any likelihood that there are certain trends relative to neuroanatomy? You had mentioned some of the genetic trends as well. Um, any, any insights from that direction? I'm not sure if I understand your question completely. There's been a lot of studies over the years that have tried to look at brain-based imaging studies to see if we can understand in a cohort of individuals who have autism compared to other developmental disabilities or to control groups, if there are parts of the brain that look different compared to those other groups. And there's several areas of the brain that have come up over the years. Um, many years ago, the cerebellum, there were certain areas of the cerebellum that sits in the back part of the brain that we often thought just dealt with coordination and motor planning, and now we know has a lot to do with learning and attention and memory and probably language and attention and lots of things that go on there. Um, the hippocampus, which is part of the uh, brain that deals with emotion and our sort of sense of self-regulation and well-being, uh, there's been you know, abnormalities based on studies showing smaller sizes in that area. So clearly, Nothing today that we can do a head imaging study and make a diagnosis of an autism spectrum disorder or necessarily rule it out, but there's been a number of areas, frontal lobes even where the executive function sits, those parts of the brain that help us get goals completed. Uh, so there's a number of areas there that I think um, from old studies would say clearly there's anatomical correlations but nothing that we can use to make a diagnosis. Now people are moving more towards functional MRI where you go underneath the scanner and you're given a function and trying to understand where in the brain certain functions may, may lie. And so one that's being done in this area and around the country is sort of the concept of face recognition. Why do some people not look right at my eyes? Why do they look in a different place? And looking at that concept of where people look in the face under the MRI and where that sort of might light up on the study may be helpful in understanding where in the brain these things are seated and perhaps make us understand the neuroscience better, which might lead to better treatment as well. But today, the main reason we do head imaging studies today when we see children with autism spectrum disorders is to rule out 
something that we can do something about. So is there a cyst on the brain under pressure causing problems with developmental progression? Is there hydrocephalus or too much water? Or is there a brain tumor? You know, God forbid, it, it, most children, you know, when they present, by the time they, and, and it still is roughly three that children are being diagnosed with this, uh, this disorder, even though we are identifying and recognizing it earlier and earlier. Um, and I so lost my train of thought there, but... Uh, well, no, no, um, I think that we were talking a little, <laughs> you were ADHD telling us that, that the imaging is right. starting to give some indications, give right. us some insights. Yeah, so and, and I'm just talking, we have twins here, and I wonder if you would see similar patterns between them, right. uh, well, I, think I would this, imagine. It, it helps us in understanding when we look at twins that are identical twins, monozygotic twins, we know that anywhere between 70 and 90% of those twins will be present with the same condition. So if they have, one has autism, we would expect 70 to 90% of the other twin. But there is that small percentage where there isn't that. And so this goes back, I guess, a little bit to what are the other factors that could play a role. But very heavily genetic in the sense of if there are identical twins, we would expect what we call the concordance or the agreement between the twins to be roughly the same. Whereas twins that aren't identical, dizygotic twins, reports would be anywhere between maybe 30 and 50 percent of those twins would have the same condition. Okay. And if you have one child in the family, how, uh, how common will it, will it be more common than the general population? If you have one child in the family with autism and you have no identifiable genetic condition or any condition you can put your hand on that would help with predicting, people would use anywhere between 6, 8, and 10 percent chance with each subsequent pregnancy of having a child with autism. So in general, you've got a 90 to 94 percent chance of not having another child with autism. Interesting chance to take, I would say. Now, I haven't talked to you yet, but you have a child who you suspect. He has some symptoms on the autistic spectrum. Okay. And give us a sense of what that means to you. Is this something that has been in your mind from when he was little? Yes, because um, he did have some speech difficulties when he was little. He did speak. He just, it was hard to understand what he was saying. So he was referred um, to child find when he was about two and a half, almost three. And they tested him for some other things and um, for OT, for, you know, fine motor skills and that kind of thing. Um, but he never presented very dramatic symptoms. So he was never diagnosed with autism. He's just had sort of different symptoms over the years. Do you have worry? All right, so you had some worries about his speech, but it wasn't that it was more unintelligible than right, it was Right, it was more articulation, delayed. right. And he has had any social issues growing up? Generally? He's always had difficulty blending in, making friends, you know, sort of missing social cues. Um, he seems to have anxiety, and so we've treated him for OCD, for, you know, hand washing, and he has ADD, so that gets in his way at school and that kind of thing. So his executive functions have never been strong. Um, so these are some of the things that have, you know, that I know are on the autistic spectrum, but not necessarily an autism diagnosis. Right. So it could be complex. Yes, very. And it can be uh, hard to really discern. <clears throat> now, she brought up a couple of issues that certainly uh, we'll talk more about, but one, of course, is that her suspicion came from articulation issues, but that she felt there might have been some speech difficulty. Mm. And then OCD, obsessive mm. compulsive disorder, is that's considered to be part of a spectrum of disorders that may be associated with uh, autism? I think when we look at individuals who have autism spectrum disorders, one of the behaviors that we frequently see are some of these repetitive and ritualistic yeah. types of behaviors that can look very similar to obsessive compulsive disorder and tendencies. And as children grow and develop, sometimes it becomes a little clearer that this really is a coexisting condition, or what my people might call comorbid, but I like coexisting better. Um, that uh, you know, it, and oftentimes might be the rate limiting step. It's that behavior that interferes, perhaps, with my social interaction, or even the social anxiety or anxiety in general. I, I will see a number of children who have language dis difficulties and anxiety. And you know, is it really under the umbrella of autism, or is it actually the anxiety and their language together that prevents the social communication to occur? I must admit, sometimes it becomes more, problem, more uh, challenging as I get older rather than easier in trying to kind of decipher what might be the real 
concern. But clearly, obsessive compulsive tendencies and anxiety are things that we often are looking at trying to treat, whether it be with behavioral interventions, potentially supplements, medicines, whatever. So it's an interesting point that you, you bring up, and that is that anxiety can exist if you have someone who's more high functioning and you can identify the stressors that might precipitate that, um, you can understand it more clearly than you could by trying to diagnose it in someone who can't communicate. Um, and you would think that possibly it's the disorder that would create it in one situation, whereas it may be underlying the disorder in the other. Interesting. Now, we don't think that Brian's had much problem with anxiety. Well. Um Gosh, I don't know. Uh, he did go through an OCD time, though, um, with videotapes. He uh, wanted to watch videotapes and fast forward, and because of the deafness and not being able to hear the movies, he would watch it and fast forward. It's kind of like speed reading. And he'd get get like three times as much seen in, in one visit. So. But, so he was really happy when you had a VCR. Oh, yeah, yeah. Well, and he not happy when we got rid of it. Yeah. So you had to get rid of it because it became an obsession. Obsession, right. And he, he had to watch the TV and fast forward and therefore couldn't watch us um, for communication. Yeah. So sure. it, he would watch it for hours and hours? Uh, uh, at times, yeah. It, well, it, because he would throw a fit or, um, or uh, I don't know, a temper tantrum. It was or, giving him that deck of cards, basically. Right, 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 yeah. Yeah, and and if if when we took it down, he would go to neighbors' houses, and because he knew everybody else in the world had one. Oh, so he knew where to so, go yeah. to get his fix. That's right. Yeah. That's right. That's and so, sometimes without telling us. Yeah. Did did he seem to grasp what he was watching at a higher speed? Um, yeah, I think he did because a lot of times it was the Disney. Uh, it, it was cartoons, so that can be pretty much seen without words. Most of those cartoons, and without words. Um, he would find a favorite spot in the movie, and, right. he, and he would rewind and go back and watch it over and over again. So he was aware of what he was seeing. Oh, and he knew how to control the oh, remotes yeah. oh, as yeah. well. Yeah, absolutely. At six and, years old, yeah. he also set it, set up the VCR. So he could uh, he could zero in on what he wanted to see, and if he wanted to see it more, he would he would do it. But uh, you know, he was just uh, obsessed with watching. Yeah. So. So, so he got pretty focused on some little parts, and I guess that was one of the things that you were talking about before with those obsessions with details, wheels, mm -hmm. little pieces of toys rather than the whole toy itself, sharing things with, uh, with people. When we look at causes, and I know that it's, a, it's an easy, let's say it's, a, it's an easy point to look at vaccines as being a cause for autism, but the spectrum of this disorder and uh, the incidents and the kinds of studies that, that I know we've looked at very seriously and very significantly tend to not point to that as a cause. And I think sometimes feeling that that is a cause more or less distracts us from other more meaningful pursuits. Uh, you were talking a little bit about the epigenetic issues, and that would be some of the combination of genetics and environmental factors. Any more insights from that particular direction that you see out there on the horizon? Well, I think if we start with the genetic component, I think we're always looking when we see children to try and identify if there might be a genetic condition that we can identify that might be helpful in understanding better the developmental picture, and it might be helpful in understanding what we need to do medically. So, for example, Fragile X, if you had one test to do and people were concerned about uh, perhaps uh, appearance of child, family history of autism spectrum disorders, or perhaps what we used to call mental retardation, now we call intellectual disability or significant learning disabilities, we might pursue more of those genetic tests, and Fragile X being one. Um, we know there are a lot of um, genetic syndromes that can be associated with autism as well, and so we might be looking for Angelman's and um, other conditions that can, can occur. We know that autism actually occurs more commonly in children with Down syndrome than it does in the general population, and so anytime there is another genetic condition, we want to be making sure we're not missing the social language concerns as well. And I think one of the pieces that we don't understand and that people are trying to study more and more about is the whole immunology of us as a being and how the immune system may react to certain things. And so I think we do feel there probably is a small subset, the question is how small, of individuals who might be 
at risk if their immune system gets overwhelmed, and would that make a difference in sort of brain development? Uh, we were talking, you know, a good analogy might be someone who comes on with acute onset obsessive compulsive disorder, tics, irritability, cranky behavior. It used to be more controversial, but I think it's now more in the main, main line to think about this pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorders after strep. And so if you have a strep infection, you've got the protein, you develop an antibody, it goes to the part of the brain that deals with some of these behaviors, and you have an acute onset of some of these things. So nowadays, if we saw acute onset, we might think, do, do we need to look at that as a possibility as well? There was a, you know, one vaccine case that was one, appropriately so, because the child had an underlying mitochondrial disorder. And then the vaccine, obviously, this child presented with autism, but also had a mitochondrial disorder. And then that vaccine may have begun to trip more the developmental concerns. And that, I think, is a very small subset. But we're always looking to make sure that there hasn't been loss of abilities. Is there significant tone abnormalities? Are there seizures that could be part of this picture that lead us to looking for, could there be a mitochondrial disorder or a metabolic condition that's the underlying reason for the presentation with autism spectrum disorder? So small subset, um, but I think this might play, this might be the one subset where immunizations could potentially play a role. At the same token, we're talking about a predisposition that exists before whatever this precipitating factor, as, right. you, as you call epigenetics. Right. right. Uh, where the environmental issues may have some impact. Um, if you look at the epidemiology, though, of large communities that follow their health care well in institutionalized kind of settings, institutionalized medicine, or, or not the best word for it, I guess, but thinking of Denmark and England, where they can trace their immunization records and they can also trace the incidence of autism, I guess that reassuring, those reassuring studies would say that with increasing immunizations, they weren't seeing increasing autism spectrum disorders. So we, and we have seen some interesting data, for instance, from Israel a couple of years back with fathers over the age of 35, mm -hmm. uh, that there was a significant increase in that frequency of autism uh, in children born to fathers as they aged above that. Right. So there's little pockets of studies that sort of pop up, and, and the question is, is that true, true, and related, or is it kind of a variable that's present and there's something else that it's an indicator of that we're missing, just yeah. like rapid head growth from 14 months up or the use of Pitocin during labor and you know, lots of things that you know, have been identified as possible causes. Yeah. I'm not sure that we really have a good understanding of those. And there sure are a load of environmental insults that people experience through the process of pregnancy. Uh, who knows what, <laughs> what McDonald's does? It may not just be junk food and calories. <laughs> I, what I'm saying is that there are so many potential uh, exposures, and now that we have, well, cell phones, and we're all running around in the middle of microwave radiation in ways that we never, ever could have imagined, uh, does that have something to do with it? It's, it's a good question. Did the boys have any kind of metabolic workup? Did they have <coughs> lab work done? Did they have EEGs? Did they have CAT scans or anything of that nature? No, just very basic to make sure that there weren't any um, genetic, like you had said, things other than autism right. that would be the cause. Um, and, you know, it certainly is hard when you hear people talk about that they know their children have been progressing to a certain amount and then started to regress in what those causes are. In hindsight for us, from day one, right. um, the twins had some issues. And I say that because I do have a third um, son that we went ahead and risked the percentages and very happy we did so. Um, but I knew the day he was born that he was not going to have um, the same issues that the twins did. I could just tell that there was a different relationship and the way he was relating even as soon as he was born. You, you have gone through then the developmental and educational workup primarily. Yes. And at I guess early on there were some issues for you with, with their behavior. You were saying that they yes. were just, they were easily just thrown into tantrums when things weren't just yes. perfect, they would disintegrate. Right, and they were so frustrated. Um, and one of the things that I remembered sharing with one of the educational consultants that came by was an incident when I had drew on my lap and out of the corner of his eye he saw my husband cleaning up his blocks 
and he did not want them cleaned up. So he turned to me and literally just attacked me and tried to scratch my eyes out. And it was kind of full force aggression. And as the educational therapist said to me, no one likes to be that angry. No one chooses to be that angry. So it really was something he could not handle that his blocks were being um, picked up. And that was his only way of communicating it. So, it, you know, it's education on how to give him the tools to express how angry he is um, instead of the full on aggression. But yes, that has been our primary um, real struggle is the aggression that comes with not understanding, not being able to communicate and express the feelings. There's a big separation there. It's, it is tough when you can't talk and all you can do is react. So it might have been hard for them to start preschool and to do the routines. Were they in the county programs to help them sort of transition through those difficult right. years? Well, before we had received our diagnosis, we did try regular preschool. So we lasted three weeks before we yeah. were kicked out. <laughs> um, but then we did uh, get into the county program and the county preschool. And as luck would have it, the preschools were full, so they had to open a new program for us. And so we had, we were the only ones in the preschool program for four weeks um, with an absolute fabulous teacher who taught um, them their first basic words. And it really just changed our life to be able to start to communicate wants and needs. And that was at about age? That was just over three. Over three. So mm -hmm. you just started to get words. Exactly. And what is their verbal level now are they communicating pretty openly they are <laughs> liz works with one of my has worked with one of my sons in school and so uh david is very good on wants and needs he um is not so good on questions about things that happened as we say remote activities you know what happened yesterday you really need to give him choices to choose from um, and he has learned to express his emotions because that's the rule in order not to get in trouble or in order to keep your preferred activity, you have to express it with words. Mm -hmm. um, so very rule-based. Uh, Drew is a little bit more further along, so he's very good with his wants and needs and makes his wants um, known very well, and, and we're all aware of what he wants or doesn't want. Um, but he has also come a long way that he can tell you the story of what happened in school. And, you know, sometimes you have to pull it out of him and try and give him options to choose from, but he has come a lot further. Is he doing okay academically? Are they he, both of them, we, we just had a full assessment done on them. And so their intellect level is right on grade level. Okay. So they Great. have the capacity to do it. it. The information just absolutely has to be presented visually and in the right way because they don't understand concepts and get lost very quickly if it's just verbal. Did they go to each other on? Was it hard to have them together in the situation? They, they are brothers. <laughs> Um, so they are actually in separate elementary schools now um, because it is a little overwhelming to have them um, together and they definitely goad each other on and they're brothers so yeah. they know what the what buttons to push for each other mm -hmm. um, but you can also tell that they're still best friends and they they really have developed that relationship with each other so they communicate Do you find that they communicate with each other better than they can with uh, other folks no. no, I mean, they, they they've they been communicating the way a lot of young children do. You have my toy and I want it, so I'm going to hit you upside the head and let you know about it. Um, so I wouldn't say they have any better communication um, between the two of them, but they will occasionally interpret for one another. If I just can't understand what one's trying to tell me, the other one will occasionally speak up. And you've been helping out with the educational side. Yes, with David. Yeah. And how did you get involved in teaching? Um, I actually fell into it. I was going to babysit another family, um, had two sons on the spectrum. And I was going to babysit one of them. And turned out the older one, who was more severe, just really related to me. So the parents thought, we'll just get her trained, and she can take over that home therapy. And then I sought a job at the county, and um, it was in my second year with the county that I worked with David. It's been satisfying. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you guys Absolutely. are pretty close. So you must have done a good job. <laughs> they yeah. must be pretty happy. So you had interventions done. At what point did you get involved in special interventions? 
Well, before we even got Bryce's diagnosis, he went to a special ed preschool, non-cat, for the speech delay. Um, but as soon as I kind of wrapped my head around the autism thing and started doing some research and um, some reading and reaching out to other families, um, I realized that we needed to get going with some applied behavioral analysis, ABA, um, which I am such a huge proponent of. Um, my son started ABA and also started making some sounds, some word pieces within a few weeks that, um, you know, he would get an M&M &M if he even made the beginning sound of a word. And he is, he's seven now and you, you know, kind of don't want him to talk as much as he does oh, now. So you can't stop him he's, from talking um, at this he's, point. And he talks like a little adult, though. He comes up with some amazing statements. Um, but ABA was the big thing for us, occupational therapy. Um, and going to the ABA program uh, through Fairfax County. So we, would have, we had home therapies and the county school therapies as well. How close are you to your brother? How many uh, years difference? Like how, oh, apart, uh, five, years. five years. Five years. Mm -hmm. So that's enough so that it's really hard for you to be too involved in the things that were going on with him. Yes. Uh, do you still help do things for him? Yes, uh, homework. I just did that before I came here. All right, good. And um, usually uh, just games and homework. So he's a, a good brother. He is very he helpful. Yeah. Yes, very helpful. It becomes a real family issue when you have oh, to deal with this. I mean, the whole family does revolve around the one with special needs, sometimes to the detriment right. of the typical child. So, um, you know, we kind of struggle with that, how much attention can we give him when we're very much consumed with that needy person that does have tantrums or wants things the way he wants them at all times. Right. Do you like them being distracted? Or would you rather have them focus more on you? Well, they really... They're, they're usually pretty both equal. They're good. They, yeah. So they balanced it well. Yeah. And you're comfortable. Yeah. You're happy with it. That's what counts. Sure. Sure. So what we've heard is that for a lot of these families, getting involved with the county assessments and the early intervention makes a big difference. Where do most people get diagnosed? Well, with the early, early intervention program, when people are sort of identifying for the first time under three and have concerns, um, I think that early intervention providers, if they've been in the field for a while, are very sensitive and pick up on the clues. And many of them try to, I think, give some hints, but I think they realize and we're not supposed to, quote unquote, make a diagnosis. Um, and so I think they try to guide them into looking at other ways to kind of put this together, perhaps, and, and, and if appropriate, make a diagnosis. Um, so I think that the ball begins to roll you know, in that kind of setting. And I think, again, because parents seem to be so aware and other people are so aware that we're seeing people question this more and more. I have children, you know, I've had a few nine, children at nine months of age come in and at 14 months of age. There are studies done about Johns Hopkins at Kennedy Krieger led by Becky Landa looking at how early can you identify by looking at siblings of children who have autism spectrum. She has a study going on now looking at children from 11 months to 21 months trying to to look at that early identification. And I think it's amazing how we do hear um, intervention making such a difference. And I think some people would argue well, what type of intervention, and we, we do want sort of good clinical trials to help guide us. We know that the applied behavior analysis, we do have some very good studies uh, to suggest that that can be a very rich intervention. I think the key issue, if you look at intervention programs at work, it's intensive. You got to work on steps, joint attention. Can I get you to join with me and, and sort of begin to interact? Imitation. Can we get something going reciprocally? So there's, there's pieces that have to be part of what you're trying to, to arrive at. But I would say that what we know from the literature and what we see out in practice at the applied behavior analysis, or with, with it being more naturalistic now and more based on sort of pivotal response and incidental kind of learning as opposed to more. What I think when some people hear ABA, they think about these old ways of doing it. it. It's much different now. It's much more naturalistic and trying to, you know, take into account the child's needs as well and not just sort of do it in a, in a discrete trial over and over way. Okay. Lots of other models out there. I think once you're available, then we really want to work on those relationships. And so there's a lot of relationship-based 
interventions that may not have the science yet behind them, but I think are, are very sound, whether we talk about floor time or the DIR model, the developmental individually based, uh, um, or developmental individually based reciprocal in nature, uh, or RDI, um, and some of the things that look at how do we get this relationship going in a more natural way. So, but it, it's very clear to me, I just, you know, I can't wait for people to get into the intervention because it's not everybody, but it's amazing how many lights are turned on with those, you know, pieces and how helpful it can be. So those have been big pieces. Uh, with the boys, uh, they've responded nicely to that. Mm -hmm. Have you had to pursue any other kinds of therapies for them? We mostly focused on ABA, um, the B Applied Behavior Analysis, and it has just um, it has just made the total difference for us. You're right, it's very time intensive. Um, you have to stick to it and know um, that this is something you're dedicated to, but the results are incredible. Um, and it's mostly teaching them the rules of society in a way that they can understand it. And you know there are consequences to all of our behaviors. And so it's bringing it down to their level so they understand when you operate this way, you're going to get what you want and you're going to be happy. And when you operate a different way, you're not going to have access to the things you want. Um, but really what the fundamental part of it that worked for us was ignoring the negative behaviors and rewarding the positive and Good. making them want to do the positive. And um, as Liz knows, ignoring the negative can be um, quite a challenge because that means when the aggression comes, you just have a poker face like they've just done nothing to you and um, it doesn't matter. And you wait till they calm down and when they start acting appropriately is when they can um, kind of rejoin what they want to do. Um, but if you, you know, sticking with it, they learn and they adjust their behavior. A parent's reaction can really empower a child. Um, I'm not sure if you could be doing the same things for Brian. Did they do ABA with Brian? Um, we, you know, I still think to this day, I don't know if we've ever had a doctor say he has autism. We've had PP, uh, PDD, but um, I don't think anyone has ever actually said, yes, he has autism. Um, just because of the communication, they don't know um, what hard to measure. Yeah, it's hard to measure. I mean, he had EEGs, MRIs, and I think he might have even had the mitochondrial uh, test. He's had genetic testing, um, normal. It, 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 it's hard to, uh, but you know, and then things like this, you, you know, you, you think he, he must he must be on the spectrum. Um, well, he's done a great job Blake sitting here today, that's for sure. <laughs> um, so the kinds of, of communication skills. It's interesting that he was speaking prior to his he cochlear was. implant, uh, which meant that he was hearing something. Right. Uh, um, unfortunately, he wasn't aided with hearing aids until 12 months, which uh, put him a whole year behind on any sort of hearing, which is the the prime time to, to start that uh, the speech. And so when we got him aided, he did start speaking, but he was way behind. And we had him in the cued speech program, and that's a phonetic sign language, which you use um, uh, hand signs to uh, help read lips. And, and he still does a little bit of that, and it's funny because he, that's when he voices is when we cue. But uh, after the implant and, him, and he stopped speaking, he, uh, we had to go to American Sign Language just to give him the big picture of, of uh, vocabulary and, and language to get his point across. He's done pretty well understand. with the sign, it looks he like. He has. Okay. He's done very well with the sign. He's ah! still, he's ah! nine, nine, it's nine o'clock. Ah! Ah! Uh, um, but he, bye-bye. Ah! <laughs> 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 well, but he, um, he, uh, has done well with sign language, but still is not, of course, at an 18-year-old level. Right. And um, and that and that uh, you know confuses us uh, as to uh, autism and deafness and what where right. what really well, takes. Well, you're picture. dealing with a, a bag of things, that's for yeah. sure. So it's been a team effort for you guys. Absolutely. What has puberty been like? <laughs> Actually, a relief almost. Um. Well, as, as you commented earlier, the shaving, um, that was a, a real fear there for a while, but he's, he's grown into it. And, um, you know, he's, uh, I guess, a normal teenage boy in many respects. Um, you know, fortunately, I don't think he's too interested in girls right now, but, um, uh, you know, he's, um, 
he's developing into a young man and and uh yeah, he is. He's, he's certainly his behavior issues have gotten better. His uh, his compulsive behaviors have gotten better. He's much more communicative now than he ever was. Um, so we see a lot of positives. You know, there are a lot of alternative ways of of trying to see if different nutritional supplements, uh, herbal supplements, uh, vitamins, um, other kinds of of approaches that people might take just because they read or hear these sorts of things. Uh, they may have some credibility and they may uh, feel pretty co confident in the advice that they get. Did, did you ever try any of uh, these alternative kinds of We, we did a number of uh, OT, PT. Uh, we did have them tested fully um, for allergies. Um, we did some herbal and that threw him into yeah. OCD, we think. We, we did some herbal, um, oh, I don't, Herbal, what would you call it? Supplements. Yeah. Um, um, not not tested by the government, I guess, yeah. but um, uh, it threw him into kind of the OCD and and suddenly, and we were wondering if that was if that was it. And the herbalist wasn't sure, and we stopped it immediately. But he never went back to um, to before the herb. Uh, and it, it, I can't even remember the name of it, but that's a, I mean, scary. I think that that those things can happen. Yeah. Probably more coincidence than it was necessarily from a lot of, lo from a the lot herb. of coincidental things have happened. <laughs> <With, laughs> um, we've tried a lot of things, and, yes, and a lot. one consistent thing that we've seen and heard is that no one's ever seen anyone like Brian before because of his his uh, behavior issues, his communication problems, and his deafness. He's sort of been a puzzle to to just about everyone we've seen. Yeah. So we've we've turned over a lot of rocks and tried a lot of things. Okay. Have you tried uh, any of the alternative kinds of diets or other therapies? There's a lot of talk on different types of approaches that way. Yeah, I haven't tried the diet. Um, we do use some supplements, um, mostly uh, vitamin supplements, magnesium, B12. Um, Dr. Conlon, Conlon is always talking about the omega-3 fatty acids, which I think everybody needs, um, but that's been shown to be helpful. Um, and, um, yeah, we haven't done any of the real um, kind of out there things that some people try and that do work for some families. But I, I have noticed that the B12 and magnesium um, do seem to help my son focus more and not have quite so many repetitive actions. Okay. Well, there are a lot of people who will pick up on certain approaches, uh, dietary changes, and obviously, with the sensory issues, kids may have quirksome diets, but are there any, well, celiac disease or the gluten and the casein issue? A lot of people will go on gluten and, and casein-free diets. Any evidence that uh, changing diet makes a difference? Well, I think one of the things we're always looking for in any interventions that we're doing is, is there some evidence base that we can back our, back up to and look at and say, if we offer you this, this is what we expect to see. And I think this is the part that's a little lacking. If you talk to individuals who have worked with lots of families who have children with autism spectrum disorders and use the diet, um, some of them will report that up to 70% they'll see some sort of change. And then the question is quantifying that change. What do you see change? The families that I see that have used this diet, and I think it's important when guiding families into whether or not to consider it or not is to make sure that nutritionally they're getting what they need to get. Because if you take <clears throat> the casein out and you take milk away, um, is a substitute there for calcium? Are they now going to have less protein because one of their protein sources is milk? So we really worry about the nutritional balance. And I always want to make sure that we're sort of broadening the nutrition as opposed to narrowing it. So very important to make sure that they are eating sources of protein and getting calcium from other places. You know, it's very reasonable to, think about, reasonable to think about reducing casein and even potentially eliminating it for a while and see. There were people that would say you needed to do it six months in order to see really a difference. There's a study that will be coming out soon from the University of Rochester that uh, Dr. Susan Hyman's been uh, part of that looked at this in a more controlled environment, and I think we'll have a better, better information about that. Um, so on the one hand, I think we want to look at some of these interventions that we don't have a lot of evidence-based science and say, Number one, is it going to cause any harm? And if so, what are the harm you know, it might cause? And what can we do to make sure it doesn't cause any more harm than not? So nutritionally, if we look at that. Um, 
and then look at what are the markers we're trying to use or targets we're trying to use to say this makes a difference. And what most families will tell me and what's in the literature is that if there's a lot of problems with gastrointestinal symptomatology and if you look at children with autism compared to children that don't have autism, their rates of constipation and diarrhea and bloating and all kinds of GI things are much more prevalent. Some people would say up to 70% of children are going to have those GI kind of concerns. What most parents will tell me, if nothing else, they seem to be more comfortable. Their bowel movements are more regular. Uh, there may be less activity, less impulsivity. Perhaps even language seems, you know, if you're more comfortable and you're not feeling bad, uh, then your language may be a little more available. So <laughs> I think that, um, so I think that it, there are certain things, and that's a reasonable thing to consider in light of not knowing a lot about, for sure, the outcome, but also knowing that you could do this in kids that eat well, and you could look at reducing and kind of see, and you probably don't have to do it for six months. If you, you know, look at it, I think the study's going to tell us this, but I don't have the answer today, that if you do it, you know, for a month or maybe two, you might be able to say, well, is this making a difference? If not, let's go back. We're also realizing that, you know, many of us probably have celiac disease much more so. The numbers of celiac now is much higher as well, and so you can go anywhere in the Washington, D.C. area and, uh, and uh, get a celiac meal or you know gluten-free meal mm -hmm. in most restaurants. And my wife is just over here at Wegmans, and she said, oh, they got a whole big gluten-free and casein-free section. So make sure your families know that if they need to do that. So, <laughs> so I think you, know, you can go into a lot of whole, whole foods and other places now and, and, and do that. But the big thing, I think, from the diet standpoint is making sure nutritionally it's sound and you're not taking away the important nutrients. Sometimes I'll look at nutritional markers. I don't, I, I sort of, dabble in the biomedical and I'm learning more about it and I want to feel that we have as much science to it to guide us. But I will look at things like iron stores and vitamin D. We all know that our vitamin D levels are probably lower than they should be. Vitamin A, zinc. So I'll look at certain things and kind of see do we need to, you know, right. supplement there. Good stuff. Uh, excellent uh, discussion. Uh, I want to thank you all for being here and sharing your stories. Really great stories. And so much more we could learn uh, from your kids and from your experiences. And I hope you've been able to learn a little something, too, about autism, and about the issues that families deal with, and a little bit about the science behind it from Dr. Conlon. I want to thank you for joining us. And, of course, until the next time, I'm Dr. Russell Libby, looking out for your health. <laughs>